Hey, what's going on? This week, our guest went from a small town in Alaska to the bright lights of the UFC. The UFC's number three ranked flyweight female fighter who just fought for the title, Lauren Murphy, talks about some of the sports tips and psychological tricks that help her get into the championship mindset. Coming up. Okay, what part of Texas are you in? Houston. Houston. And are yeah. you there just training or did you move there permanently? No, we've lived here for about almost three years now. How do you like the uh, the Texas area? I know a lot of people in the MMA and BJJ space have gravitated there. Oh my God, I love it. We love Houston. It's, it's amazing here. I know for sure this is where we're supposed to be. So I really like the weather. I like to be cozy. Uh, it's hot in the summer and it's cool in the winter, which I like. Um, the food is really good out here. There's a ton of good places to train. Um, I love the house that we bought. Like, yeah, we're just, we love it out here. The people are super nice. Yeah. Everyone likes, everyone's moving to Texas. I actually talked about yeah. going to Texas too. Cause you have a, you have kids. I have a kids and it's like golden handcuffs. I'm stuck with their school system here. And it's like, ah, Texas is where I want to be. It's convenient. It's like middle of the country. You're close to Mexico, good food, good people, good bang for the buck for housing. Yeah. This is rapidly. Yeah, the- Huh? This is rapidly becoming a Zillow ad for Texas real estate. Like <laughs> <laughs> I know. And the schools out here are great. They have uh, some of the best schools in the nation out here. So um, it is a really good place for kids too. Oh, fantastic. So you, you were born and raised in Alaska. What, yes, the, sir. what the hell was that like? <laughs> it was actually pretty awesome. I loved it. Uh, uh, Alaska is beautiful. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do outdoors. So if you like to hunt or fish or hike or mountain climb or anything like that, um, ski, snowboard, whatever, then Alaska is the place for you. So, um, it's really, really beautiful state. Um, the, uh, yeah, it, it's a really unique place to grow up and the people are, I like the people up there. There's a lot of old hippies. They just kind of want to be left alone. Um, they want the government to leave them alone. They're big on the second amendment up there. Like it, it's a pretty cool state. I think everybody should visit Alaska at least one time in their life, but most people, I think you should go twice once in the summer and once in the winter. So I actually have been to Alaska. Oh, the, cool. Juneau, Skagway, Ketchikan, uh, top of the world highway, North pole. But it was like a weird scenario. Cause I was eight or nine years old and I lived in Chicago at the time. And when you're eight years old and you go on a car ride for 30 minutes, it feels like forever. We drove from Chicago to Alaska. Alaska and uh, and back. That was a long, yeah. long drive. But, that is uh, a long drive. Alaska is beautiful, but it's kind of crazy, right? Because Alaska is closer to Russia than it is the U.S. <laughs> like in terms of proximity. Are you guys are like a th- stone throw away? Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know. I can't see Russia from my house, so I don't know. <laughs> well, in, in some respects, it sounds like Texas is kind of akin to like, if you like hunting, fishing, mountains, and things like that, it's a, could we call Texas the, the Alaska of the South, but like polar opposite, no pun intended? No, I, I say that all the time. I say it's like the Southern Alaska. Yeah, I love it down here. I And we fit right in. My husband and I have really made ourselves at home here and um, Houston's the place for us. Sam, uh, Sam Hoger, I think grew up in Alaska. Did you know of him or do you know him at all? Uh, yeah. And then now he lives in Houston, right? Yeah. So I think actually, he is in Houston now. Yeah. I've met him a few times. Uh, I met him, um, in Katy, a couple of my instructors at the time, like knew him. So I met him a few times. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I think he's a, like, it, it, I, actually he might live in Hollywood now. He's all over the place. I know he's he's doing his uh, Vin Diesel or Diesel Walk Diesel Walker like rap things all the time on his videos. It's it's crazy. We got to get Sam on to talk about his post <laughs> post Ultimate Fighter life and uh, his his crazy gregariousness. But growing up in Alaska, obviously it's really beautiful. But you know it's not a a, a metropolitan city. Do you feel like you had a a normal childhood compared to some of the things that your your counterparts had here in the the Continental Forty Eight? Oh, no, no way. Yeah, it's a, it was a lot more isolated in Alaska. Like, um, we're a lot more sheltered from stuff. You know, everything that's like a fad in, it's called the lower 48, you know, the 48 contiguous United States. We call it the lower 48. And uh, everything, any fad or fashion or whatever trend that, um, you know, went through the U.S., it always took like three or four years to get up to Alaska. <laughs> We were just a little behind the times and um, I don't know, I, you know, I played outside a lot when I was a kid. Um, I played in the woods a lot. I played by myself a lot when I was a kid. 
Um, it was no big deal to like walk down a dirt road to go visit your neighbors and they were far away. Um, you know, like snowmobiling and people living in villages and stuff like that. It just was not, it was not like a foreign concept to me. So um, maybe a little bit different, but, but you know, kids that grew up like in Montana or like in the Midwest, um, they probably had pretty similar upbringings to what I had in Alaska. Do you think that like growing up in, in more of a rural area where you were more outdoorsy, you were, you were being more physical. Um, do you think that that has helped kind of in the MMA space? Because it is a very, it, it's a masculine dominated space and, and most women aren't wanting, and most people don't want to get punched in the face. I didn't want to get punched in the face. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to do that for years. But um, do you think that like some of those attributes being a, a, like a tougher, I don't mind scraping my knee going out there person kind of translated into how we see you fight in the cage now? Yeah, hundred percent. I think, um, well, first of all, I don't think anybody likes getting punched in the face. Like I, I can't imagine anybody really likes it, but, um, the, the, I think Alaskans are just tough. We're tougher than everybody. <laughs> Alaska versus the world. Like, I, yeah, I do think growing up in Alaska made me tough and it made me a little bit more independent. <laughs> So what brought you down to the, uh, the lower 48 and when did you come? Um, I met my husband, Joe in Alaska. Um, I was living up there and had just started training and he was stationed up there with the air force and he was training. And so we were training at the same gym and that's how we met. And, um, when the air force transferred him out of Alaska, they moved him to Florida um, to Tyndall Air Force Base outside Panama City. And I, I was just, I was basically like, I'm going with you. <laughs> I, was like, I just couldn't imagine life without him. Oh, and um, I didn't really have any, I didn't even really have any plans to continue fighting. I was four and oh, all four of my fights had been in Alaska. I had won like the two, there was like two promotions in Alaska. And so I had won like the belts for them and um, had done some like, you know, really small local jujitsu tournaments just in Alaska, you know, and um, I didn't even really have any plans thinking I was going to continue fighting. And when I moved with him to Florida, I, I was like cleaning houses and um, I was still a white belt and just kind of trying to figure out what I was doing with my life. I still had some like debt with student loans and stuff and um, didn't really know what I was going to do. And I, I, I drove from Florida to Houston to get my blue belt from my jujitsu coach. And when I went to go get my blue belt from him, um, um, Invicta FC offered me a contract and then legacy FC offered me a fight. And so that's kind of how things got kicked off. Yeah. Shannon Knapp has done so much for women's MMA and Vic has been really single-handed like strike force in the beginning because they had Gina Carano in, but like in terms of an all female organization, there's so many, I'd probably say the majority of the females in the UFC now have come up through the Invicta ranks. At that time. Yeah. At that time they were really a feeder league into the UFC for sure. Yeah. At that time, Invicta was making a lot of changes for women. Um, giving them a proper weight class to fight in and just, you know, giving them a platform to showcase their skills. Yeah. You said you met your husband in Alaska. I think I heard a stat and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's like seven to one guys to girls in Alaska. So you got to, <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that too. You'll have to Google it to see if it's true, but we just say like, if you're a female in Alaska, the odds are good, but the goods are on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Do you guys go back to Alaska now at all? Or Yeah, I go back. I've been, it's been a long time since I've been up there. I need to get back up there because um, all my family is up there. But um, yeah, we went back probably like three or four or five, five years ago, something like that. See, being I'm from Chicago and I live in South Florida now. So the thing that I miss the most about the holidays is the snow. Because for me, and you've been in Alaska, right? I mean, you guys, you guys were the quintessential snow capital of the world. Do you guys get a lot yeah. of snow in Houston, or is that not um, not as prevalent? No, it snowed last year, and it was like this amazing thing. It was crazy. Uh, me and the dogs went outside and played in it, you know, for a few minutes in the morning, and then we just ran inside and snuggled on the couch. I feel you though. I miss snow sometimes too, like having a white Christmas or just waking up and you know, snow makes everything so quiet and clean and fresh. Like I, I do miss that sometimes. So, what was your first exposure to uh, MMA in the first time you saw like a UFC fight? Do you remember that? Um, yeah, actually I watched a cage fight in Alaska. Um, it was way, way, way back in the day. I had done zero training. I like smoked cigarettes. 
Um, I think I, I don't even remember what I had going on in my life. Probably nothing good. I, I had a, and I was dating some guy that was a total piece of shit. And yeah, he took me to some cage fights <laughs> for a date. And I actually, there was a girl fight and her name was Emily Thompson. And, um, she, she went on to fight outside of Alaska. There was no Invicta at that time. There was no, um, I don't even know if Strike Force existed. It, it, this might even been before Strike Force, but I thought it was pretty cool, man. I, you know, I was like, oh, that was pretty neat. And later on, I got to meet that girl, and um, it turns out we had grown up down the street from each other, um, which is pretty wild. So anyway, two females that grew up on the same street around the same time in Anchorage, Alaska, went on to be cage fighters. Each of us that <laughs> is great. was was Emily Thompson. Was that Sean Thompson's wife, uh, striking coach? I don't think so. No. No. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I know that there was. A, I think it was Sean Thompson. It might be. I might be butchering the name. So you you watched you watched her fight. Was that the first time you had seen MMA generally, or just female fights? That was the first time I'd seen MMA generally, and I just had no idea what I was even looking at. I was like, whoa, you know, it was like fights. Like I knew what a boxing match was, and I was like, okay, so it's kind of like a boxing match, you know. And we just went and watched the fights, and then we left. And I didn't, I didn't even think really anything of it. And it was a couple years later um when my son he, my son was eight so this must have been like four or five years later or something and um he I wanted him to take martial arts I was like you need you know martial arts would be great for you I always had an interest for myself but just had never had like really the means or opportunity to practice and so I was like, I'm going to take you to go to martial arts since you're, you know, you, you'll absorb it, you know, and it'll give you some confidence and direction and discipline, and make some friends, things like that. And so I took it, I took him to a Gracie Baja, not even knowing what it was. And I ended up taking an adult class just to basically encourage him. And uh, I just loved it. I don't know. I just loved it. Some little voice inside me was like, you know what, if you start practicing this today, a year from now, you'll have like a year's worth of training, you know, so don't let that year go by doing nothing. And I was like, man, that's, you know, that's true. I could, I could start training now. And in a year, you know, I would, you know, I'd be better than I am today. And so anyway, uh, I started training and I just loved it. And my son, by the way, he hated it. He never wanted to go back. <laughs> <laughs> so that was how I started and I just I started going a couple times a week like twice a week and then three times a week and then I was going every day and um, just doing jujitsu and the gi and, and learning kind of how to defend myself and learning that I was strong and competitive what was so it I stopped, huh and so what was it about the jujitsu um, class that made you fall in love with it uh I had never I had never experienced anything like that. Like I was learning like arm bars and joint locks and um, like how to defend myself, like how to be in a fighting stance. Um, to me, this was like, it was just crazy. It was very empowering. It was empowering to have that kind of knowledge and be like, whoa, you know, I'm like building some skills. And there were other women there that were brand new white belts, just like me. And uh, we would all just like wrestle around with each other. And, you know, we didn't even know what we were doing. We were like brand new white belts, but we all had each other. And so we would drill the stuff in the class and then roll around with each other. And just, I, you know, I had no clue what was going on, but um, they would always be like, oh, you're really strong. You're really good. Like, you know, you're so good. Like, you know, you should go roll with that guy over there. I don't know. It just uh, made me feel good. It gave me some confidence and um, it made me want to quit smoking because like, I could feel how gassed I would get, you know? <laughs> and so I really, it made me want to quit smoking and I never thought I would quit smoking. I smoked like a pack a day. So um, I liked the team too. I'd never been on a team really before. And it was cool to be on like a team of athletes. And it was inspiring to me to see other people that were like good at this martial art that I, I wanted to be good at. And um, yeah, it was just all new, an all new experience for me. You started doing jujitsu, I think it was like 2009 and then you started your first fight in 2010 so in pretty short order you went from hey this is fun to let's see how this happens in a real life scenario were you doing stand-up <laughs> or were you just trying to get into the the mma game or what was the purpose of getting into that no actually um i didn't really have a purpose i like literally i was like well i'm just gonna do it one time because the the whole idea of doing a fist fight scared me. So I, I was going to jujitsu. I was doing my thing, going to jujitsu a couple times a week, um, you know, getting a little bit healthier. And I saw some after the jujitsu class, they had an MMA class. And so I would watch the fighters warm up and they were, those guys were athletes, you know. And this is Anchorage, Alaska in like 2009. So um, 
these guys were fighters and a lot of them were pretty experienced, but there's not like an athletic, there's no athletic commission in Alaska. So there's like one fight promotion and that fight promotion can kind of do whatever it wants, you know? And so um, these guys were athletes and they were good fighters. And a lot of them had fought in this promotion several times. And I was just fascinated by them. I thought they were the most mysterious, fascinating, coolest people I'd ever seen in my life, you know? And um, I, th- I started working with a boxing coach that was there. And looking back, that boxing coach was so awful, but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know he was bad, you know, I had nothing to compare it to. And he said, you should do the MMA class. And I was like, no, don't, nah. And he was like, yeah, do the MMA class. You'd be really good. Like you're an athlete, you're tough. Like you'd be good. So you should do it. And so anyway, he kind of talked me into it and I went to the MMA class and um, the guys were super mean to me. They were really terrible to me. Ah, <laughs> they tried, they, yeah, they tried to like, uh, you know, they tried to like, like scare me off of the team basically and they just didn't want me there and it just really motivated me i was like well fuck you guys i'll be back tomorrow <laughs> i was like i'm gonna get better you know and i i really really wanted to be better and so anyway i started going and then um the the idea of doing a fight really scared me and i didn't like that it scared me so i was like okay i'm gonna do just one fight we'll just do one and i'll tell my grandkids someday like that i did it i have plans to be a nurse i was in college i was like had other life plans you know so i was like i'll just do one fight yeah just i just want to try it once just just let me just try it one time let me just get one one mma fight let me just see what it's like yeah it's it's addictive you get in there you get that win (laughs) whatever so no it's hard to go in there and i tell a lot of people that you know they they you the the training and and the sacrifice and the dedication and when that that cage door closes as you know you're alone in there and it's there's no better high than winning and there's no lower low than losing and that adrenaline and, and that it's, a, and it's very addictive in the process and you're you're unlike smoking you're addicted to something that's keeping you in shape um you yeah. made you made a good comment earlier about your funny comment about your boxing coach and you mentioned that i didn't know at the time he sucked which is funny <laughs> because it's the worst time to find out that your boxing coach sucks when you're in the middle of a fight but that's <laughs> that's sometimes what we see what happens. I don't know if you watched um, Ronda Rousey when she fought uh, Holly Holm. So did you? Yeah. So Ronda had just come off of knocking out Beth Cohey, and so everyone, so in Ronda's head, and let's be honest, the reason Ronda Rousey was in the UFC was because she's a fantastic judoka. She was wonderful at at submitting, taking people down not because she was a, a world-class boxer, but she comes off of this big win and then she fights Holly Holm and her corner is telling them, they're giving her stand-up, this is how we're gonna, you know, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna work fair, we're gonna punch you, we're gonna do this. And the first round, she just gets head kicked and just labeled and doesn't close the distance. And I'm sitting listening to her corner and that's when you went, I went, oh shit, her corner sucks. Cause we went back there and he, the, the advice was like, um, try again. Like, I was like, no, let's make adjustments. You know, how did you know your, your boxing coach sucked? Um, just because, um, I mean, I only worked with him for a real short time, but, um, he taught me like what a jab was, what a cross was, um, you know, the real basics and stuff, uh, for boxing, but he would just be lazy as fuck. He would have like a, he would put like a dip in his mouth. And he would wear one mitt on his hand and he'd have like a spit cup in the other hand and he'd be like spitting into a cup and holding one hand, you know, on the mitt and uh, then he'd smack you with the mitt and he would just do dumb shit like that all the time. Like he wasn't a great coach, you know, he taught me some of the basics, um, but there's, you know, there's no way that guy could ever coach at a high level. So since then in my career, you know, in the next decade or so i've worked with some of the best striking coaches in the world since then you know so now i have something to compare it to yeah and now i can safely tell you that guy sucked <laughs> <laughs> with, with some confidence and authority um yeah. that's it's funny so you moved to florida and you know legacy fighting championship which is mick maynard's uh was it mick maynard that did legacy mm-hmm. yeah and then now yeah. mick maynard is one of the ufc matchmakers does mick do your weight division yeah he does yeah mick's my boss what, do you think it was easier getting into the UFC because Mick had a chance to know you personally and, and see your fighting? And obviously 99.9% of it is your own accolades. But do you feel like that it helped kind of having Mick's eyes on you before? Well, I actually got signed to the UFC when Sean was my matchmaker. Sean Shelby mm-hmm. was my matchmaker um, in 2014 when I went from Invicta to the UFC. That was all um, under <sighs> Sean Shelby. And then he was my matchmaker for my bantamweight career. Um, I fought out my contract at bantamweight and then they did the ultimate fighter Mm -hmm. at flyweight. And when I did that, 
that's when when Mick became Mick became the matchmaker for flyweights during that season. So your does, first does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. So your first time that you get the call up to the UFC, that's that's the break, right? Everyone's finally I I made it, mom. I'm gonna be a billionaire, right? And yeah. um, yeah, and everyone that fights in the UFC knows that no, you're not. You're, you, some people are still working a nine to five, their first UFC contract, right? <laughs> yeah. Like it's it's tough, you know. <laughs> Especially was there was that point back in the UFC days where that was actually like part of the lower third Chiron graphic. You'd have a guy like this is Rich Franklin, UFC champion. He's also a middle school teacher. Like it's like everybody yeah. had two jobs. So when you first got that call and you you're gonna get your opportunity to fight in the UFC, was it a surprise to you or were you anticipating this? Um, I hadn't really, I wouldn't say I anticipate, well, yeah, I did anticipate it because I was, I was eight and oh, and, um, I was at the time I was the Invicta champion and Invicta wanted me to rematch Miriam Nakamoto, but Miriam was getting like knee surgery or something. And so it would have been like probably a year, you know, until she would have been ready to fight again. Um, and then Invicta went through, I don't know if you remember, they had some weird period where they like had a huge problem with like some internal problem with all their staff and like they didn't have a show for a really fucking long time. Like it was like six months and nobody knew what was going on. And then um, at the end of this long mysterious period, they were like, oh, we're signed to UFC Fight Pass. We got a Fight Pass deal. I don't know if you remember all that, but that's about the time I got signed to the UFC. And um, it wasn't really a surprise. I knew I was going to go at some point because I was I was undefeated and I was an Invicta champion and like six of my wins were finishes and um, they needed girls, you know, they needed to fill that division in the UFC. And there happened to be a time when they were trying to match Sarah Kaufman with uh, Sarah McMahon and Sarah Kaufman wouldn't, she wouldn't take the fight. And so that that's when the matchmakers called me. That's a tough first fight. And I think you lost a, like a really close split decision in there. At mm-hmm. what, at what point, did you go from, Hey, I want to try MMA to, okay, this is my career path. Uh, probably when I got the Invicta contract for the first time. So I remember I said, I went and got my blue belt from my coach in Houston. And, um, while I was in Houston, they had Invicta offered me a three, like a four fight deal. I think, I think a four fight deal or three fight deal. I can't remember. Anyway, actually, I think it was a three fight deal. And then legacy also offered me a fight. So I signed with Invicta and Invicta allowed me to do a one-off fight with Legacy because it had been a while since I fought. And so even though I was under contract with Invicta, they let me do a fight with Legacy. And that's when I fought Jennifer Scott. And we were the first, we were the first televised female bout that Legacy ever had. We were the first, we were the first like um, female fight they'd ever put on the main card. And so it was the first time they'd ever televised a female bout for Legacy. And I got, I TKO'd her in the first round and the next day I was with my coach at the time and I remember asking him like do you think I could really go somewhere with this like do you think I could go somewhere with fighting because I was five and oh now with five TKOs was this your boxing and, coach no this okay this is not guy. this is a different coach, coach. <laughs> yeah this is my jiu-jitsu coach his name was Pat Applegate and he was so good he took me through my first eight fights and uh like he didn't hesitate. I said, do you think I could go somewhere with this? And without hesitation, he said, yes. He was like, immediately. Yes, absolutely. I was like, really? And he said, yes, a hundred percent. You could go somewhere with this. And I was like, okay, well let's give this Invicta thing a shot and see how it goes. Cause at the time Invicta was the premier, um, you know, uh, promotion for women at that time, the female division hadn't even started in the UFC yet. They were filming the ultimate fighter to open that division at that time. And so, um, anyway, yeah, I gave him Victor a shot, fought everybody. They asked me to fight, showed up for all of them, won all of them. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the UFC. I'm sure of it. So, you know, a lot of people, especially in the Joe Silva era days, um, you'd see if someone had two back-to-back losses in the UFC, they were gone, snip, cut, just because of the roster. You obviously went on after your two losses to rack up wins, go on a four-fight win streak, fight for the belt. I mean, and have had a great run. After your second loss in the UFC, were you concerned about job security or did you feel like I just need to make some adjustments and go back? Or was there ever a point where you questioned if, if okay, if, if I lost two fights at the top tier, is this really what I should still be doing? Yeah, no, 100%. I had all those thoughts. Um, I started seeing a sports psychologist around that time. Like, 
because the fights were so weird like the fight with mcmahon really fucked me up a little bit and um i had just start i we just moved to arizona so i was with a new camp and i was kind of adjusting to all that and then when i fought liz carmouche it was the weirdest thing it was like we both it was the most boring fight ever it sucked and um i couldn't really understand it i was like what is going on you know maybe i don't belong here but then the fights were so close like i felt like i beat liz even though it was a boring fight i felt like i had beat liz and then you know obviously the fight with mcmahon was super close because it was a split decision and so i felt real conflicted because i was like i'm right there you know these are the best women in the world nobody could argue they're both fought for the ufc title they're some of the best women in the world I'm right there with them, but these fights are, you know, boring. I'm having a hard time pulling the trigger. And so anyway, I called a sports psychologist and uh, I was concerned about the UFC cutting me. In fact, I can't remember if they told me, they said, you're going to fight out your contract. And I can't remember if they told me after I fought Liz or if they told me after my next fight, but either way, I knew I was going to fight out my contract. So, um, do you feel like the sports psychologist helped? A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. What were some yeah. of the, I'm always curious because um, I think that's a big mental, the mental aspect of fighting. I mean, you can speak eloquently on this too. Like when, when someone breaks mentally in the cage, they usually do that long before they physically break. And, yeah. and, and I mean, I've been in those scenarios. Where I'm like, Oh, just take the fucking arm bar because I'm just, I'm done getting punched in the head by Tiago Alves on the ground, you know? Like, <laughs> so, um, what, uh, what were some of the things that the sports psychologist, you know, gave you or what kind of tools that you could maybe share with some of the up and coming MMA fighters? Oh yeah, for sure. So a lot of it has, you know, has to do with um, confidence, you know, just really believing in myself, being able to execute, um, you know, the way that I was in sparring. Um, he helped me understand like how to give, give a hundred percent into my practices so that I can practice giving a hundred percent, you know, um, on, you know, on fight night. And I, I had been making a lot of mental errors, but one of them was that, um, um, I, I wasn't I wasn't practicing the way that I wanted to fight. You know, that was one of them. Um, one of the tools that he helped me with really a lot is, um, focus. So like I've learned how to keep my focus a lot better while I'm in practice. And I try to have the same amount of focus and intensity during practice that I want to have during the fight now. So that doesn't mean that I have to go hard or hurt anybody. It doesn't mean I'm out there like TKOing my teammates. It just means that I'm present and focused with the same intensity that I want to have the night of the fight. And so that's helped me have a lot better practices and feel more prepared. But one of the biggest things he gave me was um, a tool that I, that I use for all my camps now. And it's, um, it's like a little notebook and I'll start keeping notes in it. So every time I have a negative thought, I will write down like a positive counter thought to that negativity and I write it in the notebook um and just other like positive affirmations things that I want to remember in the fight they're little things usually a sentence or two um you know some examples of what I might write in there are that like I know I'm one of the best fighters in the world and I'm ready to give 100 percent um to compete or um another thing that I might write in there is that um you know I know I'm in shape I know that um I'm gonna have a great weight cut um, and I know that when it's time to pull the trigger, I'm going to go like just st stuff like that, that I can read before the fight. It, it kind of pumps me up. It makes me feel confident. And so I'll keep this little notebook throughout camp and I'll add to it and add to it. And then by the time we get to, you know, fight week, I have this notebook that I can carry around. I take it with me everywhere. Um, I read it before my weight cut. I read it on the bus on the way to the arena. I read it in the locker room. And it's it's really helped me stay focused and stay positive in moments where I might start having doubts or, um, you know, struggling with things like confidence or focus that day. So that little notebook that I carry around is like, um, huge for me. I really like it. Do you feel like you get, um, I, I mean, everybody gets nervous before, before their matches. Cause we don't know if it's going to be 15 minutes or two hours before your fight sometimes. And you're, you're not ready. That's let's go. You line up. Do you get a lot of pre-fight anxiety? And if so, how do you deal with it? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I wouldn't, I, I, it's gotten better over the years and the best way that I found to deal with it is to focus on my breathing. So I have like a series of, I'm actually working with a guy named Brian McKenzie and, um, he's helping me with my breath work. Um, and so he's really going to improve that for me, but the best way that I found is to have like a specific breathing cadence and it, it's pretty personal to everybody, but generally 
if your exhale is longer than your inhale, then it's going to um, stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. So it's going to calm you down. So when I start getting really jittery, especially like the day of the fight or in the locker room or something like that, then I really focus on my breathing and um, I make sure that my exhales are longer than my inhales. I'll do some box breathing too. So like I'll breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four, hold it out for four, and then breathe like that over and over and over again in that kind of, you know, um, circular fashion. And um, all that stuff has really helped like sharpen my focus, kind of keep the nerves at bay a little bit and, uh, and help me not have that adrenaline dump, you know, when that kind of stuff comes up. So, you know, one of the things that I think we see is as when people first get to the UFC, they get that deer in headlights occasionally because it's the first big show. But obviously, if you've been on Invicta and other ones, it's not as much of a as a, a turning point. But, you know, going from undercards to main cards to fighting for a title, when you're fighting for the title, obviously, there's a lot of extraneous pressure put on you from media. You got to do a lot more media, a lot more interviews, a lot more pressure, a lot more eyeballs. Did, did you feel going into the fight with Valentina that you were under more pressure or more uh, outside influences than you had typically felt in the, your past fights? Um, a little bit. I mean, as far as outside influences, um, it was really hard for me to keep my confidence in that camp. It was super, super difficult for me to feel confident against somebody like her, you know, somebody of that caliber that has so much experience. Um, and I think it was more that than it was feeling like pressure from media, because to be honest with you, I was such a big underdog. I felt like nobody expected anything of me, <laughs> you know, so I didn't feel like I was carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders, but I did feel like um there was a a good possibility that i was going to be very very outmatched and that's an awful feeling to carry around before a fight you did, know did you get a chance to talk to the your sports psychologist at all about that oh yeah we talked about it you know at length and there would be days i would have days throughout camp where i felt very good um i would have a lot of moments where i felt confident where i, I was um, sure things would come together. And then I would have other days and other moments where, you know, I, I felt really nervous or, um, even like depressed sometimes. Um, yeah, a lot of self-doubt. And so that, and that kind of stuff I think is normal. Like I bet even Valentina has those kinds of thoughts sometimes, you know, but she has so much experience to draw on and so much, um, like proof, you know, that she can draw on about herself that I think she, she probably has her own ways of dealing with it. Just for me, that, that was probably the biggest challenge in the last camp was trying to stay confident enough to, um, you know, fight somebody like her. If you were to fight her again, what would you do? I can almost speak English here. If you were to <laughs> fight her again, what would you do differently? If anything? Uh, I think I'll have a, I would smoke more weed <laughs> during the camp. <laughs> because <laughs> I was stressed you know I was stressed uh I think I would have a much better understanding too of what the mission is in the in a fight like that you know um there was a time during the fight where I was pretty confused um I had been hit really hard you know several times and um I just got kind of confused about what the like like what the what the goal of the fight was you know like what my job was and I I rarely feel like that with the coaches that I have in the camp that I have usually in a fight, I, you know, I'm pretty confident about where I want to take the fight. I know what I want to do wherever the fight goes. I have a plan. And, um, in that fight, I think I just, um, I got, I got hit really hard and I got a little confused and I got really far away from the game plan and just kind of shut down. So you're just kind of coasting through versus being specifically delineating and movements and what you wanted to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, I, well, when the first round, I mean, I, I went from feeling like, like I'm going to compete in this fight, like I can be competitive and I'm going to bring it to her and I'm going to try to win. I went from feeling that way. Hey, sorry, my dog's over here making some noise. Chill out. <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> I went from feeling that way to just trying to survive it. Like everything I tried. Valentina shut down and not only did she shut me down but she was hurting me when she was doing it and so it started to feel real hopeless real fast um and that's just it's just never really happened to me before no no females ever really made me feel like that before uh, when did you have this that that moment of uh, uh oh my game plan isn't executing 
Um, so the first round, I, I knew the first round was going to be tough. We had talked about it all through camp. Like, you know, if you have a tough round or some tough moments in the fight, especially in the first round, like don't get discouraged, but it's just very hard, you know, against somebody like Valentina, it's hard not to feel discouraged. But, um, I went back after the first round into my corner. Um, I don't even remember what happened. We went out for the second round. I put her on the cage. Um, and I went to go for a takedown and it felt like I was trying to move a rock. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. And uh, I literally kind of, wa I wanted to go back to the corner after the second round and just be like, we're fucked. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, you guys, like, we're what's, fucked. <laughs> what, what, what else do you guys have for me? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I know, like what else can we some, got somebody, else? somebody get Ronda Rousey's corner. She like, what did they, what did they say? <laughs> like, oh my yes. God hand me a gun or something yeah, I, yeah. Just, I, uh, it, and it was kind of then that I was like you know what I don't really have anything for her and she took me down and she got on top and nobody's ever held me down the way that she did I felt like I could not move I could not I felt like I was stapled to the floor and I I was like man this is where I'm supposed to excel you know this mm -hmm. is where I'm supposed to be the best and um so it was all around just a real discouraging experience <laughs> moment by moment you know yeah, it was just a very discouraging experience that's that's hilarious do you think that um going into that fight if you could change something was it more you if you had an opportunity to fight her again would it be it's a two-part question would it be easier to fight her again now mentally and physically or do you think that it would be more of a hindrance because of how you felt in that first fight no i think um i think i would certainly do better uh, if I fought her again the second time around, um, there's definitely a lot of adjustments that we would have um, liked to. There's a lot of, you know, looking back at the camp, hindsight is 2020. So it's easy now to say, well, in camp, we should have focused on this more. We should have focused on that more. We should have done these things differently. But I can tell you at the time of the camp, we felt like we were doing everything right. You know, it's just easy to feel like we made mistakes now because the fight went so badly. Um, and then a couple, you know, we just had some stressors, I think, too. Like one of my co my head coach actually got COVID. And so he wasn't there the night of the fight. And I think it put a lot of stress on me, it put a lot of stress on the rest of my corner. And, um, you know, we tried to kind of soldier on through without it, but it just, it, it just really, um, yeah, it went really badly. It takes so, its toll, yeah. Yeah, if we were to fight again, there would definitely be some things that would be different because like my head coach would be there. We would know what to focus on a little bit more uh, during the camp. I think I would have a, you know, I would understand the mission a little bit better. I think uh, that's definitely one of the things that um, I wish I could change so much is I just really didn't understand like how important it really actually was to not stay at that range with her. And she's a, she's a master of range. She, her range is fucking perfect. <laughs> I yeah. can't say that enough. And she finds her it so range. quickly. She's finds oh, the timing and range. It's, it's, yeah. it's tough to set into a rhythm when you're playing defense a lot. Cause you're like, God damn oh, it. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I felt like I couldn't touch her. I could, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't touch her. And I felt like she just, her range was perfect. And so I, you know, there's definitely improvements that we can make if the opportunity ever presented itself again, but it's certainly going to take like, a lot of really great performances in a row for anything like that to come up again. But the sport is crazy. Who knows? You know, you never know. It's like, you know, people fight for the title sometimes because, because the craziest shit happens. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you discount a little bit of your own performance because I mean, look, you didn't come out with a win, but you still went, what was it? Uh, 19 minutes with arguably the, the baddest female fighter in that division in the world. And you, you know, you, you, you went a long time. Do you think that there's going to be an opportunity uh, coming up again? Like you just kind of talked about, because one of the things that's nice about, let's just call a spade a spade. The women's division isn't as deep, right? You don't need to get nine fights in a row to get a title shot. It's not unheard of that you could have <laughs> two or three fights and then get another shot there. Do you think that that's something that you and your coaches have talked about or what's next on the docket for you? Um, I'm not really sure right now. I'm just trying to heal up. I just, I really want to be healthy when I go into my next fight. And, um, I haven't talked to my coaches too, too much. All of us have kind of, um, like just kind of taken a break and been with our families for the holidays. So, well, except for Bob and Joe, they've been with Derek. He's been in fight camp. So, um, uh, I think what's going to be next for me is basically just getting healthy. Um, I want to do a lot of sparring if I can in the next couple months and like, just make my eyes better, you know, get in shape and um, see what comes down the pipe. The 125 division, it is pretty shallow right now, but man, there's some really like 
I don't know the women that are like, I don't know what the rankings are right now, but like even the women that are just outside the top 10 and then women that are just outside the top 15, there's some really cool and really good up and comers. I think the division is going to be super interesting in the next couple of years. Is there anyone particular in the division that you think would be a great challenge that you'd really look forward to fighting? Oh, um, who's this uh, Casey O'Neill chick? She's like fighting Roxanne coming mm-hmm. up pretty soon. Yeah, She's undefeated. Like, I, I think that's a, cool challenge you know she's a young up-and-comer and um um that would be cool i think to fight somebody undefeated like that so i'm going to be also i'll be interested to see how she does with roxanne and how that fight goes that's fantastic well i look yeah. i appreciate you taking all the time um again i'm jealous at how comfy you look there uh, pet, the do- <laughs> pet the doggy for me and i like i tell everybody if you're ever in south florida take you your husband out for a beer or coffee water thank- dinner whatever you guys want on me i appreciate you guys stopping by and taking the time yeah thank you look- thanks for having me i really appreciate it thanks a- a lot, Jason. absolutely and uh god bless alaska i'm going back there on a cruise actually uh end of next year so that'll be fun i'm looking really? forward to hit yeah. me up when you go hit me up before you go and just let me know where you're going and stuff and uh yeah i'll see what i can do that'd be awesome yes hookups i like it perfect thanks so much for coming on i appreciate it look forward to watching you kick more butt in the octagon all right cool thanks jason take care bye-bye